Hello, everyone. Um, hi, everyone. If those leaving could uh, hush their voices a little, I will get this started. My name is Juliette Samuel. I'm a columnist at The Times, and uh, I'm chairing this panel on how countries can withstand economic shocks, the obvious context being deglobalization, de-risking, whatever you want to call it, the change that's uh, happening in the global economy as a result of politics. Um, and we have a great panel here to discuss them. I will um, introduce them as we go so that uh, uh, you have, have their name as they speak. Um, but before we start, I just want to uh, emphasize, as you've been told, that this is on the record. It's being recorded. It will be watched back on demand. So there's no uh, Chatham House rule in effect for this event. Uh, the hashtag, if you want to post on social media, is uh, hashtag CHLondon. So, uh, without further ado, we will go to our first speaker who is online, uh, and his name is Dr. Raghuram Rajan. He's Professor of Finance at the Chicago Booth School. Please go ahead. Hello? Uh, I don't think we can hear you. Yeah, oh, I should yeah. also have said each, spe each speaker can has you hear two. Me now? Yes, we can now hear you. Each speaker has just two to three minutes to make their opening remarks, then we'll have a discussion. So, if you see me waving or tapping or something like that, it probably okay. means you've run out of time. Uh, I'll Go try ahead. and look at you. Okay. Um, look, uh, you just mentioned the various euphemisms, French shoring, near shoring, reshoring, de-risking, call it what you will. I mean, there is some strategic consideration here, of course, and uh, Jake Sullivan talked about small yards with high fences. Uh, but what is happening really is that we're seeing a resurgence of various forms of protectionism, uh, a desire to create national champions everywhere, a desire to you know, get production locally rather than elsewhere, so lots of subsidies. And um, you know, we're seeing a conflation of various issues. Uh, we are seeing worker uh, sort of safety considerations merged with geostrategic considerations merged with the need to green and uh, merged with uh, traditional protectionism. So uh, really uh, what we have right now is a mess uh, as far as globalization goes. Now, of course, uh, you know, a number of people have commented that we see a lot of talk, uh, so far limited action, but the action is coming and the consequences uh, are already being seen for corporations as they hesitate to invest elsewhere. Um, one example of uh, how all this plays out is, uh, you know, as we try and go green, we have massive subsidies being uh, rolled out in the United States, which of course puts the burden on the rest of the world as it goes green to match that, which then becomes the highest cost way in a sense of trying to go green for countries which are already strapped fiscally. So we really need to do better as far as global agreements go. Now, um, you know, even as globalization 1.0 is becoming threatened by uh, all these considerations, we desperately need new agreements uh, for the new challenges that are emerging. Uh, for example, climate change is already affecting South Asia and will continue to affect it even uh, more drastically as the world burns through carbon budgets. And traditionally, agriculture is going to become much more difficult. Cities are going to become unlivable. And so a lot of climate funding will have to be directed towards adaptation rather than mitigation. And we still don't seem to accept this in the, um, in the developed world. Uh, we can't even uh, summon up the financing for mitigation let alone the adap adaptation that will be needed. And of course, if adaptation doesn't ramp up, migration towards the north will be many people's options. And uh, you know, there are a huge number of missing agreements uh, when you think about all these forces that are emerging. We certainly need a climate agreement for mitigation, but we also need an agreement for adaptation, including funding, uh, you know, funding which will go to new crops, to irrigation and so on, which will prevent the kind of massive migration that might otherwise emerge. And of course, we need global migration agreements to deal with climate migrants uh, who will be coming no matter what happens. So in a sense, we need structures to preserve globalization 1.0, but we need new structures to deal with globalization 2.0. And before we know it, globalization 3.0, generalized AI and drone armies are gonna be on us. We need structures for that also.
Last point, and I'll end here. Uh, one of the questions that was posed to us is how can governments work through multilateral institutions to preempt economic shocks and crises? Well, clearly for many of the developing countries, the need of the R is debt renegotiation. It's, uh, it's going on much lower than many would want. Of course, once they deal with that, they have to maintain buffers because lots of shocks are coming. So buffers, uh, they can't ramp up debt once again back to the old levels. And lastly, it would help tremendously if climate finance could provo provide a source of equity for many of these countries without them being burdened by debt. But I'm happy to amplify later. Let me stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now hear from Jonathan Black, who's a fellow at the Blavatnik School of Government, uh, also a former uh, official in the UK government, was a Sherpa at the G7 and G20. Go ahead, Jonathan. Thanks, Julia, and uh, nice to, to see everyone here, here as well. And you, you ask us the question, how do we to prepare ourselves for, for shocks? And I, I mean, the first thing, I think we do need to be better prepared. And um, our economic and our security interests are intertwined in a way that they've They've never, been, they've never been before. And that presents really big questions, I think, for, for how we go about doing policy, how businesses go about making their, go about making their choices, and the, risk of, the risks of getting that wrong and they've just been set out by the, the, the previous speaker that one, one, one person's attempt to look at being, being more resilient is another, person's, is another person's protectionism. So I think, I would say I think there are three things that should inform how we go about doing doing policy making. And the, the first one is about, is about being really clear about what your principle is, which is, at least for countries like ours, this should be about defending and protecting our values and our open economies and open societies. And we, the geopolitical dynamics we have, we have today are such that there are some big challenges to those, some of which are inherent to being open. And, uh, but it's about, it's about managing that risk, not inadvertently undermining it. The, the second one, I think, is about, being, is about being proportionate. And again, the previous speaker talked about de-risking as one of these phrases. And in one sense, all of these different words, de-risking, de decoupling, they're all just words. But I think the, the de-risking phrase is, is, is actually a helpful one because it recognizes the nuance and it recognizes the sort of the spectrum that we need to, the, that we, that we need to work along. And, and I think that's a sort of, I think that's a sort of good place to be, to be getting to. The, the risk, as I see it, or the, the, the challenge, as I see it, is that we are trying to define this around technology where there is security risk. But the, the, the pace and the extent of technological transformation is such that it's affecting so many aspects of the economy, and what dual use looks like is going to be potentially so broad that something that is theoretically quite narrow may in practice actually be, still be very, very, very broad. And then I think the final the final the third thing is around partnerships and it's relevant to your question about how we how we work together as other countries and that's something that I spent a lot of time doing in my in, in my last job and it's it's completely critical not least for countries like ours where we need the economies of scale from being able to collaborate I, I think that we need to be hard-headed about where the geopolitical risk takes us it's going to make it it is very hard to cooperate on some of these issues in the institutions at, at, at the minute um, some of that's long-standing, you know, things like the WTO got stuck a long time ago, some are more, are more recent. So I think we will see much more plurilateral agreements. Um, and you've seen that, the US-UK thing recently, the EU-US thing, uh, some of what the G7's doing. I think you'll see a proliferation of that, and that has upside and downside. But we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't give up on the multilateral global institutions. I mean, the IMF have done some good work, in my view, around what they're calling guardrails. And I think that's going to be completely critical in the role of the G20 and thinking about what they look like. But then also, as the previous speaker just talks to, I think there's a really, really important both economic but actually national security imperative as well around thinking about how the, the multilateral institutions properly capitalized and financed can help other countries either with their transition or, or with shocks that they might face. And um, just to pick on the climate point, which I completely agree on, you know, there is a, a role for blended finance, as we were talking about just now off, off, off stage in relation to mitigation. Um, but adaptation is going to need, it's going to need real sources of public finance that, um, that it needs to be a necessary part of the picture. So looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, and now we'll hear from Isabel Mateo Siliago, who is uh, an M, uh, managing director at BlackRock. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to, to share some thoughts here. So, look, one of the 
top questions for the for the panel was, um, you know, what's what's happening with deglobalization? There's been a lot of angst about this, and 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 I think and maybe a note of optimism. Uh, I think we're actually past peak deglobalization. It's been seven years where. Uh, um, in fact, it started here, you could argue, with uh, you know, a G7 economy uh, deciding to leave um, the world's largest trading bloc. And since then, it's been relentless attack after attack, a trade war between the world's two largest economies, a pandemic that literally shut borders, an actual war that led to unprecedented uh, sanctions. Um, and, and, and then more recently, uh, this remarkable speech uh, by uh, the U.S. Uh, National Security Advisor that uh, Professor Rajan alluded to, essentially, um, in the words of Martin Wolf, expressing buyer's remorse about the kind of globalization that the U.S. had built uh, over the course of the, of the three previous uh, decades. So there's been these relentless attacks, but what's remarkable is that when you look at the data, you don't actually see all that much deglobalization. You know, yes, trade in goods as a share of GDP is marginally down compared to 2019, but trade in services is doing well. Cross-border capital flows are still growing and, and are higher than they've ever been. And of course, travel is bouncing back. So it doesn't look like the world actually wants less globalization, but yes, it does want and need a different kind of globalization. And um, what I would say in terms of why we haven't seen actual deglobalization is because, well, businesses and investors are still going to be looking around for the best returns that they can get for their, for their investments. They will respond to incentives. They will respond, obviously, to sanctions. Uh, but that is still going to lead them to, to, to spread and, and globalize. Uh, secondly, if you listen to the, 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 the large countries, the big powers, it seems to me that even just in recent months, we're seeing a stepping back from the most extreme form of, of confrontation uh, or, or you know, anti-WTO kind of, kind of measures. We've seen the resumption of the dialogue between uh, the US and China. We've seen a subtle shift in rhetoric between decoupling to, uh, to de-risking. Um, we're uh, seeing the Europeans and the Americans trying to work out, you know, ways of um, making their own national subsidies less overtly protectionist. Um, and, and, and then third, and, and I think really interestingly, we're seeing, I, I don't like the phrase global south, but we're seeing a bunch of countries that are deciding to actively uh, refuse to be uh, taken into a kind of bipolarization of the global economy, are deciding to be multi-aligned, are growing their own relationship amongst themselves. There's, a, there's an Asia uh, Middle East corridor which is, which is you know, creating itself, that is emerging, which is really fascinating. And so, um, so that is also contributing to a new form of globalization. And then, uh, last but not least, which has contributed to keeping globalization alive and kicking, and both uh, uh, Raghu and Jonathan have touched on this, is it's clear that there remains, maybe even more after the pandemic, an appetite and a recognition that all these countries are interdependent and there are topics on which you need to, you need to work together, and certainly climate change is, is one, uh, um, but it's not, the, it's not the only one. I would say issues around um, sovereign debt restructurings, we're beginning to see progress on this. Uh, reform of the multilateral development banks is a topic that's kind of been out there for at least 20 years without making much progress. Finally, we're seeing some, some real uh, momentum. And so I think while the end of history kind of based globalization it has come to an end probably, and it's still a bit of a mess as the new globalization is, is emerging. Um, uh, I think we're gonna see uh, many more forms of globalization rather than uh, deglobalization. Thank you. And now our final speaker, Karthik Romana, who's professor of business and public policy also at the Blavatnik School at Oxford. Please go Thank ahead. You. Um, so I'll make three very quick points, uh, some of which will agree with what uh, has already been said and some might uh, bring out uh, points of distinction. Uh, so uh, the first is that uh, I agree with some of the sentiments that deglobalization isn't really a thing. Uh, what we have seen instead is the United States and its core allies uh, in some sense uh, shifting away their dependence from China 
uh, but rest of the world continues uh, to trade uh, much as they have been uh, with other parts of the world. So, so, so I'd like to make that distinction. So that's uh, simple point number one. Uh, simple point number two is if, in fact, the objective of uh, Western governments is to reduce their dependence on China, then the design and development of top-down uh, policies has generally not uh, done that very well. It tends to be very blunt. And my recommendation for how you would solve that is really to require more specific and detailed audited reporting on supply chain risks of uh, particularly uh, systemically important companies in the West. Uh, so if the companies are forced to disclose that supply chain risk, uh, then uh, you know, that might, in fact, uh, result in the investors themselves suggesting alternate strategies. And perhaps they'll have more creative and innovative ways of doing it than uh, government policy. Uh, and the third is that uh, in the one area where deglobalization, if it is a thing, has been helpful, it is uh, potentially in dealing with climate change because multilateral institutions have effectively failed on climate change. I think COP is perhaps one of the biggest uh, wastes of time. Uh, it just sort of brings together a lot of people and they accomplish almost nothing and they've done that on and on and on. Uh, perhaps one thing we can do quite urgently and quickly is to have some carbon border taxes uh, the only two jurisdictions that can do that unilaterally are the United States and the European Union without really seriously harming their own economies. Uh, so if the United States were to introduce a carbon border tax and take it very seriously, this would ironically be one of the few climate change bills that would pass perhaps with bipartisan consensus in the United States. So that's where I would put my uh, attention. So. Back. Great. Uh, thank you to all of you, especially for staying roughly to time. So um, we're now going to have some questions. We've got some coming in online. If you want to submit a question online, do uh, post it and we will come to it. Um, I'm going to ask the first question and then I will ask you guys uh, what questions you have. Um, so I guess my question is uh, on the point of um, top-down policies or... Uh, managing openness, um, you know, whether, uh, whether this is, is the right emphasis for policy in countries like the UK or whether these are perhaps out-of-date sort of maxims from a previous era. And on, on the top-down point, for example, uh, you know, it, it was supply chain risk, for example. Um, I mean, we've seen a series of raids in China of companies that try to help uh, foreign companies assess their supply chain. The Chinese government does not want to allow that to happen. Um, and on the question of sort of openness, um, you know, we're an import economy, and many would say in the current environment, we're too open. The emphasis should not be on openness. It needs to be on something else. So I wondered um, if any of you have any uh, response to that or, or related. Well, I'm happy to go first. Yeah. And uh, so... So yes, I think absolutely, we're an open society, we're an open economy, and um, if you want to change that just because China is not open, then you've let China win. So that just seems like the opposite of what you want to do. You want to keep the society open, but if this involves trading with China and China continues to be authoritarian, I mean, the issue is not with trading with China, it's trading with China when it continues to be governed by an authoritarian regime, then uh, that does require you to have some sort of um, import control vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, and that's something that can be designed uh, uh, in a fairly sort of uh, decentralized format, and that's, that would be the sort of approach that I would take. I mean, the uh, other areas where I think we should abandon the sort of top-down and embrace more bottom-up approaches is, that, again, in the area of climate. I mean, you see governments making competing bets on green technologies. Some countries going after green hydrogen for steel making, others going after so-called turquoise hydrogen, which is a real thing. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, it just governments do a terrible job making bets on technology. So if instead you sort of uh, started measuring what was the climate impact of, uh, you know, what companies produce in the course of their uh, products and services, and you had an audited metric of the emissions of these products and services, then company, go governments could tax that. And that would involve uh, it, uh, proportionately impacting practices in China because they would be taxed on the emissions generated in the supply chain. So, so those would be the kind of approaches I would take to dealing with this without threatening our values. Yeah. Great. Do you want to say anything? And just, although, I mean, on the openness point, and I sort of deliberately, I deliberately use the phrase, because I think it's really important to, to, 
to be clear about what you're trying to protect or what you're trying to, trying to defend. And there's a, there's a very legitimate conversation broad, more broadly about our economic model and the sort of re-globalization debate, if you like, which isn't so much for, for, for this. But for, in the sort of de-globalization sense, I think it is important to be clear that what we're trying to protect is, a, is an open, broadly free market economy that actually has you know, a, a, a delivered a lot of growth over, o, over time, but that the context has changed, the behavior of others has changed, and that there are some inherent features of being open that present risks. And our focus, and that's my point about being focused, we have to be then very focused on where do those risks lie and, tackle, and be quite forensic about, about, about tackling them. I don't, I don't, as it happens, think there's a formula that you can follow on that. I think, it, actually, it just requires really painstaking hard work of just doing good, good policy, quite a lot of collaboration, actually, between the market and government, because it's about bringing security assessment and market insight, and market insight together. So the, sort of process, the process matters. But underneath it, I think you do need to be clear about what you're trying to protect. Great. OK. Uh, we will now go to the audience. Please raise your hand, say your name, affiliation if you have one. You can stay seated. The mic will come to you. And if you're online again, uh, put your question in the chat. Uh, yes, here first, please. Uh, so thank you. Um, uh, my name is Islam. I'm a member in Chatham House. I'm doing my Master in Development and International Business in Queen Mary. Uh, so basically, my question is, about, uh, I think, at the global level, both the Chinese and the Western version of the international economy both adopts international trade with no difference. But I mean, I guess, like, the core of the rivalry is around the economic structure of every system. And as Norbert said, like, earlier today, it's systemic. So the Chinese see, have a vision of state capitalism, whereas the state is on the front seat, while the West see that the private sector is at the front seat. So over the last three, four years, uh, the, like we've been seeing protectionist attitude orientation from Western governments in terms of honestly, like maybe like most of it is climate washed, like mainly about carbon, either we see CBM in EU or carbon border tax or inflation reduction act in the, in the United States. So we see more and bigger role for Western governments in the economy. Don't you think that this is already like a rise for the Chinese model in the Western economy itself? And this is that the state is back at the front seat under either security concerns or climate, uh, climate related concerns. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, maybe I can take that. And uh, it's actually, I wanted to comment on the previous question as well. Um, I think the way Jonathan stated the objective of some of the measures that have been uh, adopted by um, you know, liberal capitalist countries of preserving the capitalist market system while at the same time ensuring national security is very helpful. However, in most countries, the goal of the measures that are being talked about or have been adopted hasn't been stated that clearly. And I think in many cases, there hasn't been a real discussion of the trade-offs that are involved by taking some of these measures of industrial policy that we all remember from previous decades actually can have and have tended to have large economic costs. So I think this should be acknowledged more forcefully. Are people willing to accept lower growth and higher inflation you know, in the name of national security? Yeah, maybe. But this should be made very clear. And I think if the objective of these policies is very narrowly or at least clearly identified, then, then we'll be in a, in a better place. Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, if you unmute yourself, then. I am, un yeah. I am oh, unmuted. Oh, sorry. I don't know what happened there. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, look, uh, uh, just along the lines of the question that was asked, we have to be very careful because there's a slippery slope here. Uh, once you start evaluating other countries on their values, on, uh, on, uh, you know, on climate, uh, bring in a whole bunch of issues that you want to look at before you accept your goods, uh, you open a very wide door. And that door, a lot can crawl through. Uh, a lot of protectionism can be embedded in that. So take, for example, values, right? We, we don't like the authoritarian system you have. Therefore, we're not going to accept your widgets. 
Well, think of a, a conservative administration in the US some point down the line saying, we don't like your abortion standards in Europe, therefore we are not going to accept your widgets. This can open the door very, very widely. I would argue that the old system, where so long as you didn't subsidize the widgets that you made, that was fine. Don't impose your labor standards, that's extraterritoriality. Don't impose your carbon standards, that's also extraterritoriality. If you want to decide on a carbon regime, decide it outside of trade. Don't merge that with trade. I think we need to keep things clear and separate. And unfortunately today, what we see is a whole lot of, uh, of um, commingling. And this is what the questioner seems to be asking. At what point does the West become very much like China in terms of state intervention? Uh, Karthik, do you want to respond to yeah, that? Yeah, sure. I mean, so I, I, I'll clarify two things. One, that um, it's, it's not so much the values against China that would motivate the carbon tax. Um, certainly the carbon tax would have to apply to all imports, not just those from China. There would be from everywhere in the world. Um, and what you would be taxing is effectively emissions, CO2 emissions, embedded in products and services. So uh, if you think that more CO2 in the planet is a bad thing, which the science is pretty clear on, then uh, you say, well, we tax it per unit of CO2 that's embedded in any product or service. And that's one way in which you would reduce the uh, CO2 that's put out in the atmosphere. Uh, so yes, that will obviously have an impact on the kind of technology that is used to produce goods and services, and, but I think that that helps address the climate problem. Now, where you position that tax is obviously a question for the design of good policy. If you have a very high tax on it, then it can be distortionary. So that's how I'd address that. Um, I, I'll just clarify one thing for the gentleman from Queen Mary. I, I, I don't want to suggest that the United States' perspective on China is entirely motivated by values and a distinction on values. I, I, I mean, if I'm being completely objective about it, some of it is being precipitated by the prospect of not being the biggest kid on the block. Um, and the U.S. is used to being the big, biggest kid on the block and wants to continue to be that. And so uh, that is part of it. So I don't want to just say that it's purely about values. Uh, yeah, we'll go uh, those two over there. Uh, thanks very much. I'm, I'm Graham Butler from the Global Economy and Finance Program in Chatham House. So I had a question about, um, at a sort of high level, about preemption uh, in dealing with potential economic shocks versus having the tools ready to deal with the shock when it happens. So if you look at the area of, let's say, financial stability and capital adequacy regulation, you could force banks to prepare for massive shocks, but you might drive them out of business in the process of doing so. Or you could say, okay, the shock's gonna come, we'll go in with massive uh, public support and deal with it that way. So just in that general sense, how should one weigh up those two possibilities? Thanks. And we'll go to the gentleman in front of you and then we'll come back to. Uh, my name is Kei Ando. I'm working in Japanese embassy here. And I have a question, especially to Mr. Jonathan Brack on the uh, division of labor or expected role of G7 and G20 as a former Sherpa. And G7 summit heavily focused on the geopolitical issues, but at the same time, mainly focused on the economic security this year. And uh, in the upcoming G20 summit, uh, G20 must uh, tackle on the global issues like uh, energy security uh, challenges, but the uh, geopolitical uh, implication must be addressed or uh, considered. So I I'm interested in your view. Thank you. Maybe we'll go straight to Jonathan on that. Um, well, thank you for your question, and congratulations to Japan on your presidency of the G7 this year, mm -hmm. which I, I, I think you, you, chaired, you chaired brilliantly in very difficult, very difficult circumstances. Um, it's a really good question, and if we were having this conversation 15 years ago, we'd, or 20 years ago, we'd be talking about the G20 sort of replacing the G7 as, 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 a, as, an, as an organization or as a sort of, as, a, as an entity, I and mean, we've not really seen that. I mean, the G20 obviously has become the main body representing the biggest economies in the world, the sort of just the reality of shifts in economic power have, have, have done that. Um, and the G7 is no longer that. What we've seen in, in the last two couple of years, really, from the sort of the point of which 
uh, when uh, the last the US presidency chairmanship went under Trump, when there wasn't a summit, but then through the UK presidency and into the, the war, in, war in Ukraine, I think you've seen the, re, the G7 rediscover itself, not only as an economic forum, but actually as one that's about values, since we've been talking about value, values. And I think we will see that continue, myself. I think they, the, other, the, the group of countries involved in that, and perhaps some others, will find it as a, a good place to coordinate, including on some of these, some of these things that we're talking about here, because it's, it's, very, it's, it's, it's very tough, as we found with things like, like, like the IRA, to collaborate when you're also economic competitors. It's just, you know, there's just a load of tension sitting in that, and probably the G7 is the place to do it. Um, and so the, the G20 is a, is a completely different, a completely different kettle, kettle, kettle of fish. Um, it's, um, it, it's much, much more difficult to make, to make progress. Um, you know, the, the, wider, the wider geopolitics plays through much more obviously. Um, and countries have a much broader range about what they think they think the body should be. It's not impossible, actually, in the run-up to COP, the Glasgow COP, notwithstanding your critique of it, Carthic. Um, actually, we did use the G20 to lay the ground for some of what some, for some of what came for that. So it is it is possible. It, it's one of those things, though, where you do need to keep it going because when because when a crisis really hits, you need an entities like that to be able to perform the sort of role that they did during the financial crisis, and ideally that it potentially should have done during COVID as, as, as well. But I think the prospects for it being a place that can deal with some of the issues we're talking about here are much, much more difficult. But I don't think we should give up. I think the sort of guardrail type things I was talking about, what's the sort of underlying sort of set of things there, I think it's, it's something that hopefully my, my successors are all working on because I think it's important. Uh, and the question about, you know, regulatory approach, comparing it to capital adequacy with banks, does which of you, uh, you know, maybe you could apply that in other sectors to cost? Yeah, I mean, Rob is uh, probably best. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you go ahead. Well, uh, um, I think, uh, for example, on liquidity, Mervyn King has a very nice idea of trying to get banks to pay for it up front, but they would only pay for it, they would pre-position uh, their payment and they would have access to plenty of liquidity as and when they needed it. Of course, this requires a lot of uh, uh, supervision of the banks that are asking for it for public sector pricing. There are some details which have to be fixed, but that's an example of pre-positioning, not so much capital, but access to government help. The problem if you don't force people to pay something for it is of course that um, you know there's moral hazard. You don't take enough precautions against it. Now, there are some situations in which, you know, moral hazard doesn't matter that much. You know, nobody is going to be well prepared for a massive earthquake or, you know, massive flood. Uh, but, and that's where the government comes in. You can't really pre-position for those calamities. But for more moderate calamities, it helps for people to pay a little bit for the insurance they're getting, for that keeps them on the straight and narrow. If I could add a, a line, I don't know if Krian was asking about banks or about countries, but... I, th uh, I think uh, he was using banks as a sort of metaphor. As a metaphor, yeah. so, so let me handle perhaps the, the, the country side of things. Um, I mean, one thing that's been very clear, and we just had, you know, a very real-life experience of a, of a generalized shock in the form of the pandemic, and it's very clear which countries have, uh, you know, fared better through this, and clearly the ones that had their own house in order, that had their own buffers, if you will, that had self-insurance, were hit, but they were able to, 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 to deal with the, the, the shock relatively smoothly and rebound relatively rapidly. Uh, the ones that uh, had not been able to build these buffers and this self-insurance needed emergency assistance. They got it because the this sort of global safety net worked in that way, but they're still in, in, in deep trouble. In fact, you know, a large number of them are now in debt uh, distress. And so I think what that illustrates is really the importance of keeping your house in order as a, as a mechanism of, of first order. And, and, and really one thing that is remarkable is coming out of the pandemic, the way that frankly mo many emerging markets were on the front foot in dealing with uh, the inflationary shock in a way that advanced countries were not. And guess what? Now they're seeing, you know, nice and rapid disinflation 
ahead of all the others and, and ended up paying less of an economic price for it. So uh, I think there are lessons to be, uh, to be learned from this. The global safety net is important, but keeping your own house in order probably even more. Uh, I'm going to just go to some of the questions online because there's quite a few of them. And they, uh, one theme is uh, about countries outside the developed world. Uh, so, Jana Adaronke Tomori from the Nigerian think tank group Worldwide um, has asked, uh, well, two, two questions related, whether the African Union should be part of the discussion on climate issues uh, and whether, you know, there needs to be more inclusiveness of all continents in tackling these issues. Um, and then uh, Molly, I'm sorry, I'm going to mispronounce your name, but uh, Molly uh, Trebazile de Lama Jurkin from the University of East London also raises the point about countries from the global south. Um, you know, and, and Isabel, you said this deglobalization thing is really just a, a almost just a Western idea. Um, it's not even happening in the rest of the world. So I wonder what forums or ideas or, you know, if we're going to have... Um, sanctions, you know, but it's, it's just some parts of the world applying them, then how should we think about the rest of the world? S who wants to respond first? I'm happy Pathic. to go first sure. on that. So, um, look, I've just come from a two-day conference on carbon accounting. It's a very, very technical conference. And um, we saw companies from around the world present models of how they would embrace very rigorous measures of CO2 in their production processes. And the two most impressive presentations were from one of the world's largest tire manufacturers based in China and one of the world's largest steel manufacturers based in India. So don't underemphasize or underestimate the potential of companies in emerging markets to be truly revolutionary if you set the rules of the game in a way that they can compete on a level playing field. So if you said we were going to measure things like CO2 emissions in your production process, well, lo and behold, it turned out that the Indian and the Chinese companies that were piloting the process did the best or amongst the best uh, of, of the various companies that uh, were present. So in the same way uh, for those who are writing from uh, the African perspective, I would say that let's take a perspective on it where everybody is clear as to what, are, what is it the metrics that they should perform on and then unleash the competitive forces to do that. If you continue to provide handouts and if you continue to try to provide SOPs and this and that, then my sense is that you know, we're not going to make any progress, A, with self-sufficiency in the African continent. We're not going to make much progress with solving big problems like climate change either or debt dependency and so forth. And um, just on that point about um, uh, sort of, you know, the, uh, the banking issue, the one thing I will flag, uh, the, the one profound error we have made in the early 2000s, and we saw this manifested in the 2008 financial crisis, and, and it, we haven't corrected it since, is for 600 years, um, uh, accounting principles embedded what was called the principle of prudence, which is the idea that you hold losses to a lower standard than gains. And so basically, losses are recognized more aggressively than gains. It's just common sense why you would have prudence. So this is no, nobody mandated prudence as a rule. It had been sort of developed for 600 years. And in the early 2000s, we abandoned prudence. Uh, and we continue to pay the price on balance sheets because balance sheets are not built on the same principles that they were built for 600 years. So I think if there's one thing we can fix is reintroduce prudence. There are some simple common sense things that we can do that don't need grand global agreements that that's where I would rather start. Great. Um, we, will, we have a question there, and then we will come to you guys. So go ahead, please. Hi there. I'm a CFC member. Um, my question is, uh, do you think that global monetary and financial uh, institutions will ever truly be um, multilaterally run, or do you think that the, independ the independency between uh, nations um, will continue at, to be weaponized um, and various power asymmetries will, will continue? Uh, also, I forgot to come to any of the others, others of you on the previous question, so if you want to answer that and I maybe weave can, in. I can share a view on that and also the point about the African Union in the, yes. in the previous question. So I, I would say I, I thought it was remarkable when, uh, was it a few days ago the, or last week, the, uh, um, the Kenyan Prime Minister said, you know, we need to get rid of the uh, MDBs that we have because they're beholden to... Uh, rich countries and they're never going to solve anything for us and particularly not climate finance and we need entirely new institutions. For, for, for me, it's a, it's a great failing that there is this 
this perception out there. Uh, having said that, as I was uh, saying in my opening remarks, I, I do think that there's a growing awareness that these institutions need very serious reforms, number one. Number two, um, I think for the last few months, or at least it's quite recent, but there seems to be now a genuine understanding on the part of the developed countries that financing the climate transition in the emerging world is not a matter of charity, it's a matter of actually solving the problem of climate change and that it needs to be done and that it's going to require uh, different modes of intervention and in particular uh, a, a genuine effort on mobilizing private sector financing and that again requires changing in uh, the ways in doing business. I think what we saw come out of the, the Paris summit uh, last week was encouraging. Um, you know, who knows how much the COP will deliver, but it seems to me at least the problem is now framed in the right way, and that's probably a good place to start to actually solve it. And just to, just to pick up on that, I mean, the easy answer to that question, I, I agree with, with everything Isabel's just said, but I would add to the point on the climate transition that it's not just about in, in, in Western countries' interests in terms of climate. I also think in relation to some of the issues we're talking about here around security and national security as well in terms of um, global alliances and, glo and, and, and global stability too. On the, just on the question on, on the sort of other countries uh, that was in the, the previous one, I, I think we could talk about this for hours in, in the context of everything that's happened in, in relation to, to Russia and Ukraine, and we touched on it in, a, in another session. But one of, for me, one of the big things that's come out of it is, 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 a, is a real clear reminder that we're not in a bipolar world, actually. We're in a world where there are a number of other very significant countries in their own right, not proxies of, of, of the sort of, that you saw in the sort of previous, in, in the Cold War, War period. And how that evolves, I think, will be very, very interesting. Well, you know, the roles of countries like Indonesia and, and, and India and others. Africa's a specific, the, the question I asked about Africa, and I, I, I think there's a specific point there. One is, is when we talk about deglobalization, I think there's a real risk there for Africa. That if you think about the evolution of global supply chains, you know, many of those things started off with, with moving into China, you see that moved or then move on to bits of Southeast Asia and Mexico. If you can imagine the supply chains evolving in turn, it would have then moved to South Asia and then to Africa. And I think there is a risk with, with deglobalization and the, re, and the reshoring of some supply chains that Africa will miss its turn. Um, and that's quite, a, I think that needs a, needs a bit of thought. And to the question, to the, the point the questioner asks, Actually, Africa's voice is not as strong as some other continents in the global, in the global in institutions. I mean, COP is quite good at that, but in things like the G20, it's just South Africa, which at the time made a lot of sense, but is now not the biggest uh, um, economy and country in that sense. So I think the debate on the African Union's role in the G20, um, which I think the Foreign Secretary was asked about earlier, I think is actually a really important one. Uh, can, I, can I come in here? Yes, yes, go ahead. Sure. Um, sorry for being a, the voice from on top. Um, <laughs> look, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, we have to be careful about focusing only on efficiency in some of these discussions, right? There, there is a big issue of fairness also. This especially pertains to carbon, and I know this is a never-ending discussion. But think about unilateral border adjustment taxes. Essentially, they focus on efficiency. They impose a carbon tax on the rest of the world. That's, that's good from an economist's perspective. But if that's all you do, you abandon the whole issue of fairness. How do you get other countries which haven't participated in putting the carbon in the air to get some of the benefits of, uh, uh, or some of the help in adjustment? And they typically tend to be poor countries. This is why I think it's very important. We have a global agreement that Africa be absolutely part of that agreement because they will have to do a lot of uh, adjustment themselves. And, uh, and uh, it would be only fair that, uh, that they got the financing to do that. Uh, second point, uh, I think uh, on multilateral institutions, I think they're changing. I mean, they have changed a lot. Uh, they probably have changed a lot since when Isabel and I were uh, in the IMF. But, but I think the, uh, the problem is, as, uh, as the questioner asked, that the industrial countries don't want to get let go still. Why does, uh, for example, this is a small thing, but why does the US still pick the president of the World Bank while uh, the IMF is picked by the Europeans? I mean, this is archaic, uh, and uh, I would hope 
that the next time this comes around, uh, you pick the best person in the world, whoever that is. And, uh, you know, uh, for all the talk about uh, opening up these institutions, so long as the head is picked in a close, uh, behind closed doors, I think it doesn't do justice to the process. Great. We'll come to here and here. Is there anyone over there? No. Uh, we'll see after these two what time it is and if we can fit in any more. Uh, go ahead. Thank you so much. I'm Jennifer Lynn from Dartmouth and from Chatham House. And uh, I wanted to ask what you thought of the, the wisdom and potential efficacy of the Biden administration's export controls against China. And again, my understanding about in terms of efficacy is uh, an effort to keep China off the military cutting edge, not forever, because I don't think that's seen as being possible, but for as long as possible. So to what extent is, is this going to be an effective way to do that, or maybe a wise policy to attempt, even if it might be effective? Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, it doesn't seem to be working. Oh, it's working. Thank you. Uh, my name is Yaroslav Manoch. I'm with the UCL Institute of Sustainable Resources, also Sham House. Um, and I have a question related to what was discussed previously about carbon tax, probably uh, to you, Prof Professor Romana. Um, so I agree with you, by and large, that punishing polluter is a good idea when we speak about mm -hmm. pure economics and putting car carbon tax to fix ma market failure probably is a good thing from pure economic perspective. But we also have to be careful in that impose that in the US, in the EU, could simply lead to carbon le leakage to other countries. However, as we know, car carbon tax didn't drive solar PV in Germany or offshore wind in the UK. We didn't increase price for everything, right? That was the role of the government. So I think we should be thinking that the government could still play a critical role, both in the West, but also in China, when we speak, for example, for EVs. So uh, I guess my question, do you think that um, sticks or carbon tax is the way forward? And secondly, when we speak about um, collaboration, not just EU, US carbon tax, but how about the role of R&D regulation and standards as coordination between the countries, not only in the West, but elsewhere, India is a very big market, China, if they collaborate on standards or specific industrial issues on steel making rather than overarching carbon tax. What was your thoughts on that? Thanks. Um, who would like to go first on, uh, on the, the advanced uh, technology export controls? It seems like your wheelhouse. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, um, I mean, I think my answer to the que your questions, I think they are necessary, but I think, it, I do think the, the and I, I'd encourage everyone to read Jake Sullivan's speech, because I think it is an attempt to actually to sort of present the, the, the argument that, that the Americans make about this, and that's why I think the de-risking the de phrase is, that, is actually a, help, a helpful one. I mean, uh, my, you know, my background is, you know, and I sort of just defended openness, but we do need to be absolutely clear about, what, about the activity that others are taking and the intent behind some of those some of those, some of those things, and take measure, and take necessary, proportionate, but targeted measures to <clears throat> to protect against those things. And um, broadly, that is what what those are about. The earlier tariffs, the sort of Trump era tariffs, were obviously different, but the, this this measures is more about is 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 more about that. As I say, when I sort of think about it as a sort of as a half recovering policymaker, if you like, I think that. The challenge is it, it is the right intellectual thing to say we want to narrowly focus these things on areas around technology where there is a sort of sensitive security risk around dual use. The challenge is that in practice that narrow theory might be very broad and how you manage that is quite, is, is quite complicated. Um, but that's the sort of job of policy if you like to try and, to, to try and, to try and get it right. Um, but I do, think, I do think in one sense regrettably they are necessary. Uh, so we've had quite a lot of discussion about a carbon tax. Um, so if there's any more you want to say about that, you can. But I wonder also if you want to address the point about standards. There's a lot of talk about, you know, design, collaborating on standards among countries with, you know, free f values of freedom, but that doesn't seem to actually happen much. Yeah, sure. Um, so, so look, uh, I don't want to uh, create what I might see as a false dichotomy between efficiency and fairness. I think that in the context of solving the climate crisis, 
there isn't that dichotomy in part because of the urgency of what it is we need to get done pretty very quickly. So the goal here is to get to geological net zero as soon as possible. We are very, very far from that. Uh, and the idea that we would be able to solve this by all sitting around the table and holding hands and somehow coming up with a magical solution that works for all countries strikes me as far-fetched. I mean, it, we're, we're, we'll miss the deadlines on geological net zero by miles if that's our approach to it. So hence to take more of a, a stick approach to it and say, well, let's put out attacks and, and let's start driving compliance quickly. And likewise to um, you know, the situation with Africa, I would say that, um, the, I mean, the best advice I would give African leaders uh, is uh, to sort of focus on building their economies to be excellent at something important, because that's what's going to get them a seat at the table uh, much more uh, quickly and much more reasonably than uh, the idea that they will somehow be able to negotiate, uh, you know, a kind of democracy and multilateral decision making. And um, does anyone else want to come in and also make a very quick final remark? Because we are well, going to wrap up. Uh, let quickly, me add Dr. my final Rigu. remark. I, I don't think fairness and efficiency are um, the same. Uh, I think they're different. Uh, I also think there's an extent of arrogance in thinking that the West will be the stick and the rest of the world will come into, into compliance. I think the rest of the world is already doing a lot hasn't done as much damage as the West has done, and therefore is asking the question, what should we be doing and how much are you going to help us? That's what the African countries are asking. That is what the Maldives are asking. And I think we need to address their concerns also, rather than saying efficiency will take us all where we need to go. I'm, a, I'm, I'm from the University of Chicago. Lots of faith in efficiency. But this is an issue of politics, of fairness, and I think we need to address that issue also. If I can add yes. just one word on this. Actually, when you look at what the US is doing, what Europe is doing, what China has been doing, it's been using carrots, not sticks. And that's having a tremendous impact. And so the idea that somehow we use carrots at home and sticks for the rest of the world strikes me as perhaps not entirely right. Uh, right, so with that, um, I will wrap us up and hopefully bring us back to being vaguely on time, uh, just with a quick summary. Um, well, there's clearly a very big disagreement um, on what a moral trade policy looks like, whether it should be a moral trade policy. Actually, I think by the end we'd we agreed there should be some morals in trade policy, but it just looks very different as to who you're trying to... Um, who you're trying to, to, what you're trying to achieve. And then the question of actually, is it about outcomes um, and you know, what's the most efficient way to achieve what we want? Uh, then the question of deglobalization, is, it, is this really deglobalization or is that actually obscuring that what is happening is a group of countries that have lost trust in each other and they are now managing the consequences of that? Um, that seems to me perhaps more what's happening here. Um, and then just to bring it back to shocks, which was the initial question, which in some ways we didn't go into, um, I mean, we, we ended up sort of talking a lot about fairness and less about shocks and protection. And, and even, you know, populations in developed countries, for example, who feel very, um, that they really haven't been protected from the consequences of globalization um, and all of the, you know, economic imbalances that have built up. Um, but that's something we didn't have time to get into, but uh, seems important to mention as part of the discussion. But with that, I would like to wrap up and say thank you very much to all of our speakers.